finish up where we left off in part 3, we're going to continue by completing the bumpers and the belly pan for this design. The belly pan and bumpers are one of the most important parts of your robot. A good belly pan is something that for our construction type is essential, and bumpers are almost always required by the rules in FIRST Robotics. We use a laser or water jet cut belly pan with riveted construction and the belly pan acts as our template for squaring the robot frame during construction. This part can be heavy if you go too thick, but on average we use an eighth of an inch to three sixteenth of an inch for thickness on the belly pan. Depending on what kind of pocket types and how many holes you're going to remove for weight savings, this could vary. You can also use plastic, but be careful about the weight, thickness, and brittleness of certain plastics like acrylic as these will shatter in shock loading. At Yeti, our belly pans feature an access panel on the bottom for access to our gearboxes and shifters that has saved us many times for maintenance during competitions. It's something that we recommend you do as well if you're going to use a two-speed transmission. There are two unique methods to creating a belly pan for a robot, and this is going to depend on your resources as a team. First and foremost, if you have access to a water jet, high def plasma, laser, or CNC router that can cut aluminum, then this method is going to be considerably easier for you. Try your best to get a company in your wheelhouse that can turn a part around for you in two or three days so that you can make these year over year as fast as possible. If this simply is just not an option for your team, then we can create a simpler belly pan using standard cutting tools like a jigsaw with metal cutting blades and hole saw bits to create the pockets. Another thing I will mention is that if you can purchase expanded aluminum sheets from McMaster Car and slap that onto the bottom of the frame as a belly pan, you can use a tapped uh, thread into the frame. I really don't like this method as it can be more time consuming and requires you to weaken the metal in certain places to cut around objects like gearboxes. We have used expanded metal once. We've tried and been successful with all these methods, so do what you can with what you have. I have two methods to create the belly pan and CAD. One is a normal part where you need to carefully measure and cut each part and make sure you match the holes in manufacturing. And the other is in context modeling where I create the belly pan referencing other parts in the assembly. You can follow along with these steps to make the part in context if you've never done this before, or you could just make a part file separate, drop it into the assembly, and edit the part until it works. The trick to creating the belly pan that I want to point out is that we use VexPro pre-drilled extrusion with holes one inch on center for our drive rails. When we cut this tubing, we always line the hole pattern up perfectly so that we are able to use the hole patterns that are one inch on center all the way down the belly pan of which half of them will line up with the holes drilled one inch on center in the tubing. When we assemble the belly pan, we drop the rivets in the holes that are open and fill as many as we can in so that when the frame is sitting on the table, it'll fit perfectly up to the belly pan and then we can rivet everything in. After that, we carefully match drill the rest and rivet those in if we're missing any in the pattern. This makes for a very strong, rigid connection that for us has never failed. We usually do the front and back rails first on the belly pans and we assemble the drive rails with transmissions as one assembly separate because this is easier to drop in later. At this point, we finish riveting them to the belly pans to join them up and make one frame. We cover the full assembly process in the last video. In CAD, it is easy to get the pattern for the belly pan. I'm modeling this in context, so I'm going to create this belly pan body inside of the frame part, but I'm not going to merge the bodies. Again, if you want to create this as a separate part, you can do that too. Start first by just grabbing the outside extents of your frame on your frame part that we've made in the previous video. Now we usually split our belly pan into three pieces because we almost always have shifters. If you have a single speed, then it is not as necessary to split the belly pan because you won't have shifters to go around. If one of those piston fittings starts leaking, you will appreciate this panel. One thing to note is that splitting the belly pan makes it weaker so you're advised to create some cross bracing of some sort to stiffen the frame further if you go this route. We usually have some 2x1 or some mechanism that sits on our frame that accomplishes the stiffening for us. Again, if you're not sure what mechanism types you're going to be using, this is okay, because you can always drill the rivets out and bolt something on top for modularity later. This is the beauty of this system, it is very forgiving. I'm going to stop my pocket right before the transmissions on either side with both belly pan halves and avoid the gearbox. You'll also make slots for the bearing sliders, but before you do that, watch how I dimension these slots in case you need to make a design change. Dimensioning from the wheel center means that if your wheel center changes, that this slot will move. Make sure this is large enough to adjust the chain by allowing the block to slide, so don't make this super close. Leave like a quarter of an inch of space, and leave it deep enough to easily get in there and access the parts for maintenance. 
This is a big time saver, so do this step and make it easy on your team. After I have the hole in the middle and the holes for the bearing blocks to clear, I can make our access panel portion of the belly pad, which often has our brand signature on it. Hopefully, nobody ever sees this on our robot unless we're the ones flipping it over. We usually offset this and add a few rivet holes to attach it so that if we need to remove it later, we can drill it out. After it is mechanically sound and clears everything in the way, check in the assembly to make sure all is good. I usually do this in context in my assembly, but please don't do this if you're new to CAD, as you will light up your assembly with errors. Everything looks good here, but if not, make adjustments now. From here we need to match our hole patterns and create the patterns for the rivets in the pan. Pay very, very close attention to this step. When we cut the tubing, we will have a hole pattern already on it. We want this to line up on our belly pan. We start from one corner of the robot, any corner, and create our pattern one inch on center with 5 30 seconds holes to match the Vexpro tubing and 5 30 seconds rivets. By doing this, every hole is going to line up on the Vexpro tubing from our belly pan. You really don't need to model this hole pattern on the tubing, but if it helps you not make a mistake when cutting your tubing, do this. Teams that will not be using a CNC to cut their frame can simply match drill into the frame once the frame pieces are clamped down to the bench and the belly pan is sitting on top. At this point, go ahead and stop and talk about where your battery needs to go, flat or standing up and where on the robot. You can incorporate this into your belly pan design early and save some time. I've started making my students design their battery mount such that I walk into the shop and I'm going to flip the entire robot upside down and shake it violently to make sure the battery stays put. And they know this, and they design awesome mounts because of this. Since the battery is usually the single most heavy thing on the robot, if you design it into the frame now, it's going to help your center of gravity considerably. You can also use the belly pan to mount electrical components. If you intend to use the pan structurally to attach other parts, stop and think about this as well. If your belly pan is an eighth of an inch thick, be careful when you plan to bolt heavy things to it, especially if you have a split belly pan. Because if you bolt something too heavy to that pan, it's going to flex and it's going to make things on top bounce. The last thing about the belly pan I want to discuss is pocketing. You can make some beautiful designs or some simple designs. You could even spend some time cutting shapes for every electrical component on your belly pan and this part is completely optional as to how you do it. A simple method for us is the slots method, but we've used the fancy pockets with our rookie team. Whatever you do at this point is up to you, but make sure you go ahead and radius every sharp corner because certain machines, if you're using a CNC, will dwell in a sharp corner and leave burn marks or blow the material out. This will also help the negatives drop out easier and your sponsor will prefer that. If you have a thin belly pan, don't go crazy on pockets because it will flex like crazy if you do that. Be wary of long pockets too. You want support down the middle and sides where the pan attaches. If you're mounting electronics on the pan, go thin on the pocketing and thicker on the material so you protect these parts from shock loading. If you're not using a CNC, you could simply drill a bunch of circular holes in the belly pan to lighten the weight. Next, let's look at bumpers. This is something we've done differently every year since 2011, and I'm sure we have not nailed it down perfectly yet. But luckily for 2018, we made our easiest bumper system yet. Using sheet metal on three robots, we had no real issues and no dropped or damaged bumpers ever. Bumpers will revolve around the game and the design of the robot, so I can't talk too much about how to build them because they might be illegal for the next season. But I'm going to try anyway. If you have a protected wheel well, then the example by Team 254 here will work wonders. Mount some 1x1s one on top using some riveted gussets, and then throw some 1x1 one one angle on plywood and done. We used a similar method in 2018, but with thick sheet metal as our perimeter due to the open wheel well. You can see this on our GrabCAD folder. We had a crash bar on the front and back, and you can't see it, but we also put some anti-crush pieces that connected to our tower on afterwards so that the angle didn't get T-boned and buckled in and we also put some stiffening gussets on the corners in week two of build. It worked for us, but we need to refine this design more before I recommend it. I'm sure you guys could probably think of a couple of ideas to make this better. We might actually follow this up with a bumper video if requested. At any rate, these brackets weighed about one pound each and worked for us and our rookie team too. So if you have this ability to form these up, I would make them a little stronger in the corners and try out something similar. Once you're at this point into the CAD, you pretty much have a complete drive base with belly pan, and you're ready to order some parts. 
This next video will discuss the parts and a basic bill of materials for the West Coast Drive so you don't forget to order anything. The hard part is over guys. Let's get this bot in the mail and built.